Welcome everyone to TPA's third Thursday at two training series webinar uh, for May of 2023. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, some very successes under the PACE program, why things are really taking off, uh, hitting an inflection point, and how you can get involved and take advantage of PACE. My name is Deb Taylor, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Texas PACE Authority. Uh, joined TPA a couple of years ago. Uh, after almost 30 years of, of public service, uh, most recently running the State Energy Conservation Office, uh, prior private sector experience in commercial real estate appraisal and tax consulting. And uh, again, I've been with TPA for about uh, two and a half years and uh, spend uh, my time, uh, as you probably can tell from prior T5s, uh, handling a lot of the education and outreach activities and working with states and st state and local governments. So for today's webinar, Everyone is muted and your video is disabled uh, to prevent any distractions that tend to pop up uh, in, at these uh, sort of events. And so please use the Q&A. Uh, it should, be, uh, should appear at the bottom of the screen, uh, not the chat. And I'll keep an eye on that and make sure that any questions that get asked during the webinar are answered uh, at the end. And uh, if something else occurs after the uh, webinar, I'll provide my uh, contact information and you can follow up. We can follow up offline. So to, uh, if you're an attendee today, you will receive an email uh, with a copy of these slides so you don't have to write things down quickly or do screenshots. They'll be provided as we, and the uh, links in the screenshots uh, will be active as well. So you'll have those for later. And then we'll record this and it'll be on TPA's website and our YouTube channel for later in case you have colleagues that might benefit from this, uh, but weren't able to attend today. So with that, a quick recap. Uh, we published our annual report for 2022 earlier this year. As a 501c3 nonprofit organization, uh, we are required to uh, do a couple of things. One is file an annual report on activities. Uh, the other is to maintain a board of directors. And the, the third uh, is to file essentially an annual tax return called a 99 that's, that's uh, equivalent to a tax return. Uh, so uh, all of our uh, activities are there publicly available, uh, just the nature of being a nonprofit organization. So the annual report is there uh, under uh, uh, the direct link is there on the bottom, but also if you go to our homepage and at the bottom it says about us, you'll see this year's annual report or last year's annual report rather, and then the prior annual reports and other related information. A couple of things to point out. I mentioned we do have a board of directors. <clears throat> uh, really pleased and honored to have uh, these folks advise us and provide strategic guidance. Uh, Steve Block, longtime real estate attorney, Mike Kravaki, uh, an industrial uh, efficiency expert, John Hall, an environmental and policy expert, uh, Charlene Heidinger, who's also our president, uh, Yarkis Lewis, who was the sustainability director, city of Plano for many years, and is now with the Dallas Federal Reserve in a similar capacity. Uh, Penny Reddington, former judge from Ellis County, Carlton Schwab, who is the CEO of the Texas Economic Development Council, and Patrick Worrell, who's a, a newer member of our board, uh, who has a lot of background in clean energy finance. So that's our board. That's who they look like. And then our team, uh, this is us. I mentioned Charlene already, our president. I'm the chief operating officer, Marina, who you may have worked with, <clears throat> program advisor, does a number of things for us. Jonathan, an engineer and finance expert, uh, Christine, uh, it heads up our transactions group, uh, Amy, uh, operations, Autumn, uh, program manager and outreach, James, our general counsel, and then Deborah does our website uh, and all of our other uh, related activities around cre creative uh, products. So last year was busy. Uh, we had uh, 71 different public presentations throughout the state, uh, corner to corner, uh, participated in over 500 different outreach events. And then we had a series of these T5 webinars, which are all there listed again on our website, uh, starting January 20th and then ending in December 15th. Uh, so uh, pretty much one a month. So those are all there as a resource for later. Also, 2022 was a uh, very busy year with project closings, uh, set a new record, almost 172 million in new PACE projects in 2022. And things have started busy again this year. Uh, about half of the projects for energy efficiency, a third water conservation, the balance distributed generation, mostly rooftop solar or solar projects. And uh, the majority of these in the commercial and retail uh, property setting, 
hospitality, commercial office, uh, a different mix, as well as uh, some nonprofits in there as well. So our agenda today, I'm going to go over these, these uh, different items. Uh, we'll have a, an opportunity for Q&A at the end, and I'll provide some resource links too. So the drivers and pain points that make PACE very relevant uh, is, are, are these. Uh, the fundamentals that uh, property owners, business owners know that they can save money over the long term by making investments in higher efficiency equipment, uh, plumbing fixtures, et cetera, uh, up front. But these, uh, these different projects have very high capital costs, can be disruptive. Uh, and uh, given all of their other uh, financial obligations to core mission, growing the business, making payroll, it's really hard to, to redirect capital uh, for these investments. And so what happens is the equipment fails uh, unplanned. Uh, your AC goes out in July, not in December. And so uh, you quickly have to, to replace that equipment without a lot of opportunity to find the best equipment or optimize systems. And then a new construction, uh, there are always budget constraints and the things that are less visible, like the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems that are behind the walls uh, tend to, to suffer those cuts. Uh, and, and those decisions at the front end go on to haunt the building for years uh, through higher operating costs. So these are financial challenges that are just reality. And the impact of, of this is that we have higher operating costs, lower building performance, uh, indoor comfort challenges, uh, mold uh, is, a, is, a, is an issue in the majority of the state uh, with, uh, with higher humidity levels. That also, in, in sort of the face of our new reality that, you know, because of weather conditions, water and energy, energy consumption is going up, uh, colder winters, uh, well, that's kind of a new phenomenon. We've always had hot summers and that continues, but now we have colder winters also. And then also energy costs and water costs are going up. And they're going up for reasons that we can't control. Uh, energy is a is a global commodity. Uh, mar markets set the price as consumers were price takers. Uh, so it's best to manage uh, our our consumption and our our energy consuming and water consuming assets as smartly as possible. And then also there are uh, policy issues that that affect energy and water costs that again are beyond our direct control. So taking control is really a uh, the theme here, and then paces paces a tool that allows you to do that. Excuse me. Overall energy consumption. If you look at the the red line that kind of bounces up from the left to the right, this is overall electricity sales to commercial sector uh, for the last couple of decades. Uh, you'll see that the other sectors uh, or the other uh, sources uh, are fairly stable or predictable. Uh, so the gas consumption, that's kind of the orangish brown line that bounces up and down in the middle, that's very seasonal, but the peaks aren't really that much higher relatively than the, the lower peaks in the earlier years. Not the case with electricity because we're plugging th more things into the wall, we're conditioning more space, and a lot of the growth is happening in areas where we're using air conditioning uh, where we may not have done that before. So consumption overall in the U.S. is going up. <clears throat> in Texas, power prices are going up, and we prided ourselves in Texas on being a low cost energy state for many years. Uh, this is, uh, we're a producing energy state, which certainly uh, it would make sense that our prices are lower, but uh, prices have gone up here and uh, we're no longer a, a low cost energy state the way we once were. We are certainly lower cost than some other states, but uh, the trend is changing here. And if you look at the, follow the lines here and look at the commercial sector, that's the green line, it sort of hovers from 2017 to 2021, you know, around that uh, eight or nine cent a kilowatt hour uh, charge, and then and then boom in 2021. Of course, that's February. That's winter storm Uri. That's when the lights went out. That's when prices spiked. That sort of reset things for a while, and I think it opened the eyes of a lot of business owners too. That hey, this is something we need to manage more closely. After that, it dipped down again, but as you can see, the trend line is kind of up and to the right, and so. There's a number of reasons for that. Uh, part of it is the commodity cost itself. Uh, natural gas is the uh, the fuel uh, the fuel cost that goes into the majority of our electricity generation. So as gas prices go up, that gets reflected through through electricity prices. But also, uh, in an attempt to harden the grid and ensure that uh, the lights don't go out again, uh, there there have been a lot of uh, 
uh, preventative measures taken to harden the grid. And there are significant costs that go with that. So uh, $10 billion uh, to uh, associated with uh, Winter Storm Uri here in the Storbs article, uh, also uh, covered in, in, different, uh, in different local papers and the media. And some of these are, are long-term costs baked into rates. Uh, so for example, uh, to harden certain, certain components of the electric grid, uh, that may be a, a 15 or 20 year investment that's recovered through rates over that time. So that's not necessarily a commodity or a timing related issue, that is a higher baseline. And so again, that builds into higher electric rates going forward. And the same thing for gas. Gas has you know, always been very volatile. Uh, the purple line on the left, if you're trying to, to budget uh, around something like that, that's a challenge. Uh, it did spike pretty considerably, 2022-23, uh, and it's dropped back down. Uh, but, uh, but again, uh, uh, higher costs as we're seeing you know, more demand for uh, exported liquefied natural gas to Western Europe uh, to replace Russian gas, things like that, will continue to, uh, to have uh, pricing impacts as pressure is placed on, on our gas inventory. And then again, like the electric side, uh, securitizing costs uh, and, and spreading those to rate payers has happened in the gas industry too, uh, as indicated by this article on the Railroad Commission. So gas is going up as well. So if you're, if you're an owner, how do you mitigate? How do you, what, what do you do? Well, uh, energy and water efficiency projects uh, can be financed in a cash flow, uh, new, or a budget neutral cash flow positive way. And what you're doing here is you're really you're taking uh, an OPEX component in your budget and converting that to, app, to, to CAPEX uh, or, or changing uh, what is an expense uh, to an investment, really kind of rethinking how you do that. The savings can pay for the project. And again, this can be done in a budget neutral way. So if you look at the, the graph at the bottom, the, the illustration here on the left, so this is a typical budget uh, and utility budget uh, before any efficiency improvements have been made. You probably have uh, you know, half to three quarters that are utility related costs. Those are bills you pay each month. And then you have maintenance costs too. And so the older the equipment, the higher the maintenance costs. And all of that goes into that circle. After you make energy or water improvements, your maintenance costs go down, your utility costs go down, and you can use that delta, that, that blue wedge that's pulled out, uh, is the savings uh, to pay for those improvements. Now, the key to this is that savings piece is there, but you still need the upfront capital to make those investments. And that's where PACE comes in. So let's talk about PACE. So PACE is, you, as you may know, if you're on the, on the webinar today and you probably are in, involved or have done some research, it stands for Property Assessed Clean Energy. It's a financing structure. It takes third-party financing, private financing, uh, secures that with a local assessment lien provided by a city or a county, and that allows a lender to make a loan for a much longer term so that the costs of the project, including financing, align with the benefits, the savings over that term. Uh, so it's like, a, it's like a public improvement district, but it's just for one property at a time, not a cluster of properties the way a, a PID is normally structured. State law in Texas authorized PACE back uh, 10 years ago, and cities and counties, it's an opt-in uh, arrangement. So cities and counties uh, can create local PACE programs if it uh, makes sense for them, and many have. It's voluntary and open market. Uh, that means that any lender uh, can provide the loans, any contractor can do the work, uh, really at the choosing of the property owner. Uh, and, and again, any city or county can opt in. And of course, any property owner can access it. As far as eligibility, uh, any commercial property, including nonprofits, we'll look at some case studies later uh, that involve nonprofit facilities, uh, multifamily units, and then industrial or manufacturing or agricultural. Uh, about the only type of property that does not qualify is single family residential or residential four units or, or less. And the types of things that PACE can pay for, if, it, if the project reduces energy or water usage, or generates, demand, or generates power on the customer side of the meter, then it's something that is potentially eligible. So HVAC, lighting, plumbing fixtures, uh, building envelope improvements, so higher levels of insulation, uh, better windows, uh, reflective roofs, et cetera, all those sorts of things uh, could potentially uh, be financed through PACE. 
And these have to be permanent improvements to the property. And by permanent, the definition we use is it needs to remain in place as long as the financing. So not forever. If a building's going to be there for 100 years, uh, you're probably going to replace the, the, the uh, AC uh, at least every 20 years. So you're going to have you know five AC systems over a 100-year life of the building. So it would need to remain in place and, and be operational uh, at least uh, you know for the length of the financing. So PACE is different, and why, why PACE is different from conventional equipment financing. If you look at a conventional scenario, uh, a property owner says, okay, I've got to replace my HVAC, my lighting, and uh, uh, I don't have the internal capital, or maybe I do, but again, it's, it's prioritized elsewhere. Uh, so I knock on my bank's door and say, I need a loan uh, to replace this equipment. And they say, great, that's, a, that's an equipment loan. Uh, it's unsecured because in the event of a default, uh, we're not going to come remove the equipment. So the max term on that is going to be six years and uh, or maybe five, it depends, but, but not, not very long. So that means that all of the repayment for that equipment happens in the first uh, four or five or six years of that equipment's useful life. So your repayment is higher than the benefits that are delivered by the new, more efficient equipment. So you're upside down financially from a cash flow perspective. And so that's that really is a disincentive uh, to use conventional financing in that way. What PACE allows you to do is using the local government assessment as security, it allows a lender to make a loan for a much longer term. So that means that you can align the costs and the benefits over the term of, or over the useful life of the equipment. So there you can be cash flow positive day one and throughout the loan or the loan term. And that's really the, 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 the key difference. Also, PACE can be, uh, in, I think in every case of projects that we have closed, it can provide 100% of the financing, where in the case of a conventional loan, there's probably a 20% down. And if you look at some comparisons there of, a, of the th sort of the three options, self-funded versus conventional versus a PACE loan, and we have this calculator on our website, so you can plug in your own numbers and do your own scenarios. Uh, what it shows is, is, again, the PACE loan option, the blue line at the top, is cash flow positive day one and throughout the, the life of the project. Uh, the other two options uh, go cash flow negative for a period of time before they begin to, to cross that line. Uh, so that's really the key benefit. So PACE addresses a number of different investment barriers. Again, no upfront capital needed. Uh, all costs of the loan can be financed and rolled into it. it can be 100% financing, uh, funded up to the life of the equipment. Uh, that's the weighted uh, useful life of whatever is being financed. So, uh, for example, if you have uh, solar panels, uh, that might they might have a 25-year manufacturer warranty. Uh, so that could be a 25-year loan. Uh, doesn't have to be as long as the useful life, but it could be. Again, 100% financing. Uh, in the case of uh, of, uh, of lease space, typically a PACE uh, loan or or the repayments uh, can be passed through to tenants as an operating cost because. It really uh, uh, sits like a tax lien on the property. And if the lease provisions allow operating costs to be passed through, then those costs can be shared with the tenants. The tenants, in turn, are getting much better space. They're getting improved air conditioning and lighting, lower operating costs, so, so it balances out. And then it, because the assessment is tied to the land, at the time of sale, the PACE assessment or PACE loan conveys automatically. It can be paid off. Uh, at the time of sale too, but by design, it stays with the property. So it's almost like the property is borrowing, is borrowing uh, and, and making the investment, not the owner, uh, because it is tied to the property. So <clears throat> PACE is opt-in, as I mentioned already. We have 87 cities and counties around the state that have opted in and have created local PACE programs. Uh, this covers about seven, about three quarters of the state's population. A lot of gray area here because we're a big state and, and much of that is, is rural and sparsely populated. Uh, but it is uh, active now uh, in these areas and, and even more on the horizon. Uh, there's two next week uh, that we'll be adding to the list, we believe. Uh, so as word gets out, more cities and counties want to offer this as a tool in the toolkit. So our role, Texas Pace Authority and all of this, is that we work for the cities and counties that have set up PACE programs uh, exclusively. We serve as their outsourced 
fast-paced department, if you will, and we work then with the property owners, the service providers, and the capital providers to make sure that their, their applications, the projects they put together, uh, all uh, comply with and conform to the PACE statute and enabling statute, as well as as guidance documents. Uh, so we don't provide the financing. Uh, we don't do the work. Uh, we're, we kind of referee the transactions, as I like to say. Uh, so uh, that's to avoid any potential conflict. So, so that's who we are, and that's what we do. When the PACE program started, again, uh, the state legislature 10 years ago passed the Texas PACE Act. Uh, after that, there were some uh, guidance documents called PACE in a, in a Box that were put together uh, by a, a group of stakeholders and volunteers with expertise in these areas. Uh, from that, uh, we then developed our program guide. And uh, that program guide on how PACE works, how to apply uh, all the answers to all the questions is, <clears throat> is there posted on our website and is updated periodically. These uh, guidance documents are not static because things change, obviously. As, uh, 10 years ago, uh, you know, the, some of those things might have made sense, but they, they could have changed. So there's a very deliberate process of periodically reviewing and updating these guidance documents. And that's been done a few times, as you can see here. Our new program guide version 4.0 was released last year. It's on the website. We tried to make it uh, more user friendly. Uh, the nature of you know, uh, putting these these uh, transactions together. It's like a, it's a real estate financing transaction. So there's a lot of details, uh, but we tried to make it as, as user-friendly as possible. And so part of this, and, I, and really key, uh, this slide uh, from an operations standpoint, uh, if you if you want to go back and, and look at any, any slide, you might go back and look at this one. This really kind of outlines, you know, how PACE works. So there's two key phases. Uh, there's a phase one, which is pre-application, and phase two, which is post-application. In, in pre-application, uh, this is where an owner is trying to figure out, okay, uh, does is does pace financing match with my needs? Uh, does it fit my project? And is it is it something that we want to pursue? So determining eligibility, that is, you know, do I have a commercial property uh, that meets those definitions? Is it in a pace region, uh, et cetera? If yes, then determining the scope. What is my what is my uh, building need? Uh, is it uh, HVAC? Is it lighting? Is it some combination? And then uh, how can I bring in professionals to help me identify those things? Uh, bringing in a lender in step three, that's important because you want them with you as part of your team all the way along. So they'll understand how the project is developing and, uh, and they'll support you in many cases and, and often have some technical resources to help uh, defined projects uh, in addition to providing lending. So then you prepare the application, if all of that still makes sense. And then at that point, uh, we move to uh, sort of the quality control and review stage in phase two. If there is a existing loan, senior loan or mortgage on the property, consent from that mortgage holder is, is required. Uh, then step seven, uh, this is a key quality control element. Uh, since the since the PACE loans are premised on the savings that uh, that they help create, uh, how do you know? How do we have confidence that these projects are really going to save money? So the ITPR, this is an independent third-party review. This is a Texas licensed professional engineer that reviews the, uh, the application, the technical side of it, says yes or no. Uh, you know, does this project make sense? Does it look like the assumptions that are built into the savings calculations for those industry standard? Uh, and are the savings reasonable? If, if that's all good, then the project moves to financing. <clears throat> the upgrades and the project are installed over whatever period of time that takes. Then after that's completed, the same independent third-party review engineer uh, comes on site to check and make sure that everything that was in the scope has been installed and is operating correctly so that the savings that the owners expect uh, will be there. So that's really the the, the steps in, in sort of two phases of how a project works. Some of the underwriting criteria, uh, the savings to investment ratio. Uh, this is really important. Again, how do we know that these projects will save the owner money? Uh, a, a savings, uh, an SIR of one or greater for every project is required. So that means that the projected utility and operating savings and financial savings 
uh, from the project uh, are, are at least as much as the total uh, uh, financed costs of the project. If it doesn't meet uh, that, that SIR greater than one, uh, then the owner can contribute funds or perhaps uh, utility rebates, other things can buy down the cost of the project so that it does. The loan to value, PACE can be used for up to 25% of the appraised value or assessed value of the property. And this can be uh, as complete, uh, an, an appraised value as complete or as stabilized uh, in, from an income producing uh, property standpoint. Uh, so up to 25%, that way uh, uh, properties don't get over leveraged uh, with a PACE loan. And the, the loan term matches the estimated useful life of the project. I mentioned this before. So there's no predefined loan term, but if it's a, uh, you know, again, a 20 year uh, weighted expected useful life of the project, then a loan term could be up to 20 years. Uh, it could be shorter, but it could be that long. And then again, mortgage holder consent if, if applicable. So the SIR, the basic math is this, it's the savings divided by the investment and it's gotta be one or greater. And in this scenario, uh, the example is HVC and lighting improvements. Project cost is a million dollars, including the cost of the financing. Uh, those are all the costs. Uh, and this project qualified for utility incentives of fifty thousand dollars. So, so the nets nine fifty. So the savings projected for the project were nine fifty. The investment net nine fifty. This meets an SIR of one. So that's how the math works. On the technical side, every project has an energy and water analysis uh, that's performed that conforms to the technical standards. This can be done by the owner, any contractor, any engineer. Usually uh, what we see there is on existing buildings, a baseline analysis of the existing conditions, and then uh, the improved uh, situation, uh, the savings are modeled from that. And the delta between those is, is the savings component. Uh, in new construction, uh, PACE can be used for new construction as well. And there, since there is no baseline, there's no existing building, a, the whatever the local applicable energy code serves as the baseline as a proxy. And so there, uh, the, the, the project would be designed to, to, to be at least 5% uh, higher performance from an energy water standpoint than minimum code. And if that's the case, then that could qualify uh, those, uh, those different measures and new construction uh, for PACE. Uh, this all comes together under water energy and water assessment report. And again, is reviewed by the, the licensed independent third party. All of these costs uh, typically uh, get rolled into the loan. So there's no uh, cash out of pocket necessarily uh, from the owner. These are uh, kind of viewed as transaction costs. We have a workbook. This is an Excel uh, workbook that can be used uh, by anyone. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, available free on our website. And you can put, put, like, plug in the different variables for the project, and it will calculate the SIR, the LTV, and some of these other underwriting criteria to see if the project matches. So you can scenario plan with this. Uh, if if you you plug in numbers and and it doesn't hit uh, those uh, those key qualifiers, then you can make adjustments and figure out okay, I either need a higher efficiency piece of equipment, or I need a lower cost, or some combination to make it all fit. So that's a tool that's available both for contractors doing the initial analysis plus independent third-party reviewers uh, so they can uh, review those projects more efficiently. The simplified process on the project side is, again, the contractor does the analysis, uh, the independent third-party reviewer uh, does that savings review prior to construction, moves to construction, and then it's verified after to make sure everything was performing. <clears throat> Excuse me. So accessing PACE and, and how do you uh, how do you engage and, and how do you move forward uh, with a potential PACE project? Everything's on the website and uh, it's divided into, into different areas. Uh, across the top, uh, there are drop down menus. What is PACE? Where is PACE? These are all the areas, eligibility tools, different uh, resources, uh, both technical and, and, uh, and financial. Uh, a list of our all the projects uh, that have that have closed. That's usually that's very useful because you can look at that and you can see either, hey, here's a project that's maybe in my area uh, that has used PACE, and how does that project look? Or uh, here's, uh, for example, a you know a standard commercial office building, and here's here's what was involved in that project and the cost, uh, the project details, the lenders are all captured there. 
then events and training. And then if you're a property owner, you can just jump to this area first. And that takes you to the set to all the information that's most relevant for you. Same thing with local governments considering setting up PACE, contractors and service providers, <clears throat> lenders and capital providers here. So everything's there on the website. So where is PACE? Uh, this is the drop down again. And when you click on that, you'll see a map. And uh, on that map, there'll also be next to it, there'll be a list of all the cities and counties. Uh, if you click on one of those, each one of these has a page. And so it'll tell you uh, when the resolution to create PACE was adopted, if there are projects that have closed, uh, case studies of projects, they're all there. So each, each different jurisdiction uh, has its own page. Supporting that, uh, the Department of Energy last year came out with this tool that's a market assessment tool that sums up all of the commercial property uh, within a, uh, a particular region could be a county or it, it, every county in the state has this and some of the larger cities have it at the city level. And it looks at the, the age of the buildings uh, through sort of commercially available data sets. It looks at typical uh, energy and water, or energy, energy efficiency measures that would be applied to older buildings. And then it, it screens uh, for projects that hit that SIR greater than one criteria. And from that, it uh, shows, you know, so for example, uh, non-refrigerated warehouses might be the best opportunity within a particular uh, city or a county, or it could be uh, healthcare facilities. Uh, so it's, a, it's an excellent screening tool. And we produce these reports for any of the cities and counties that we support. <clears throat> if you take all of those cities and counties, the blue shaded areas here on the map, that means that this tool has, has shown that there are roughly 187,000 buildings uh, in scope or pace. That means they meet the SIR of greater than one, uh, over 4 billion <clears throat> square feet, <clears throat> excuse me, that would amount to uh, over $15 billion in pace funded projects, uh, again, that meet SIR greater than one, yielding savings for owners of over $23 billion. So while uh, you, you may recall from the earlier slide, <clears throat> we're roughly at about uh, $400 million uh, in closed projects. There, we, we barely scratched the surface. So there is plenty of opportunity uh, out there across the state. Uh, and, and again, PACE is a, is a great fit, uh, financing a fit for many of these projects. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at case studies. Uh, this is the fun part. How does this actually look where the rubber meets the road? So we've had uh, urban and rural, all types of end use, uh, again, water uh, efficiency, uh, energy efficiency, distributed generation. Uh, smallest project, 68,000, largest, 40 million. And all of these have received 100% financing. You can look at the project list if you go to our website and hit this drop down. And when you do, this little calculator will total these up. So 77 projects, roughly uh, $395 million. We uh, track job creation too, uh, direct and indirect, because some of these obviously are construction jobs to do the work. But then in the case of, of a uh, PACE project, uh, say supporting a hotel that wasn't there before, uh, those are jobs created at that hotel that are longer term. Uh, environmental impacts are calculated, the total energy uh, saved in kilowatt hours and, and MMBTUs for gas, and then uh, gallons of water saved. <clears throat> so the very first project, uh, PACE project in Texas, was at a temple in Austin, so a nonprofit facility. Uh, you might think of PACE being just for commercial. Well, a church or a synagogue or a house of worship is a commercial building. It's, it may have nonprofit ownership, but it is a commercial building, and so a commercial building is eligible. And in this case, this was an aging facility that ironically uh, has uh, solar panels on the roof that a member of the congregation wanted to donate, but what it really needed uh, was new HVAC and controls. Uh, those were like 20 years old. They had, they had different uh, parts of the building that were unusable because of temperature control challenges. So PACE was used uh, here to replace, to finance the replacement of all that MEP equipment. Because of uh, the nature of the improvements, uh, they qualified for utility incentives for the local utility and the assessment total of $450,000 and resulting in 20% savings annually. <clears throat> this is a project, uh, actually new construction, under construction now 
uh, just south of Dallas and Red Oak. It is a uh, one of these sort of mega uh, theater entertainment complex uh, centers that has, I think, bowling alleys and restaurants and bars and 12 movie theaters and everything else in it, uh, kind of on one site, one stop shopping for entertainment. And here, uh, the owner went above code. So again, in a new construction uh, baseline is, is the applicable local energy codes. So they specified uh, higher levels of insulation with uh, building envelopes. So ceilings or roof, uh, roof walls, windows, et cetera, uh, higher efficiency lighting, uh, higher efficiency HVAC systems, plumbing fixtures, and even elevators. And so by doing that, they were able to finance Six and a half million dollars of this complex, which um, costs is, is costs a lot more than that to construct, but six six and a half million dollars uh, was shifted to pace financing out of the entire capital stack, and the result of that is compared to a code compliant building, the savings for this are 20, 28 percent uh, annually compared to that, and it also helps helps future proof this facility is going to be there in operation for a long time. Energy and water costs are going up. So as they go up, uh, those will be mitigated uh, by these decisions made on the front end. This is a uh, warehouse in uh, Corsicana, Navarro County, south of Dallas. Uh, it was repurposed uh, for a for textiles uh, manufacturing, and it needed new HVC and lighting. Uh, this was a uh, $324,000 uh, PACE loan assessment, and this is one where uh, the facility now provides 60 local jobs in that community, which is very important. So in a manufacturing or a, or a, uh, any, any sort of industrial complex, uh, PACE can be applied as well. Here's a, a feed store in Elgin, Texas, that the owner wanted to put solar panels on the roof. So they did that, and they secured a grant through the USDA for part of the cost. They also secured a rebate uh, from the local utility, from Encore to cover part of the costs. And then they finance the balance of that uh, through PACE. And this is resulting in, in, uh, in, a, in by reducing their, their electricity consumption by almost a quarter, or actually over a quarter. This building in Dallas, uh, you see City Hall, Dallas City Hall, if you're familiar with downtown to the right, was repurposed uh, into loft apartments and, uh, and a hotel uh, on each end. Uh, it was it was a total gut rehab and repurposing, uh, so uh, everything was needed. And so here, the PACE eligible measures were the HVAC system upgrades, the lighting, the insulation, the windows, and plumbing fixtures. Almost $24 million PACE loan, uh, significant savings, uh, both uh, electric and water. And to dive a little bit deeper into the financials of this one, uh, this is an excellent way to look at it purely from a financial standpoint. So before the developers of this project uh, had a capital stack uh, that equaled uh, roughly $116 million. So that was the cost to do all the work necessary uh, to turn it into the lofts into the hotels that they envisioned. And the breakout in the blue column here, are the blue cylinders, so senior debt, uh, historic tax credits, and equity. And they filled that, that gap they needed uh, or at least they had planned to fill that gap they needed with a mezzanine loan of $22 million. Uh, it is not unusual at all for mezzanine financing to be at a very high interest rate, like 15%. Uh, and so that was pretty unattractive, and they were looking for alternatives. So what they realized is that if they shifted the PACE-eligible measures into a PACE loan, then they could secure a PACE loan, in this case, at 6.13%. And they were able to actually do a little bit more. So the PACE loan was roughly $24 million. And the impact of that is that it brought their, their overall weighted cost of capital for the project down 20%, simply by shifting the PACE eligible uh, components of this, of this uh, repurposing project uh, from mezzanine to PACE. This is new construction down near the coast in Rockport uh, after Hurricane Harvey. Uh, passed through uh, pretty much all the rental property in that area was devastated and was not being rebuilt as rental property. So apartments were needed. And this developer uh, had the foresight to not only uh, help ensure that that uh, this property was hurricane and wind resistant going forward, but also 
future proofing the energy and, and water features. So they designed it to be above code, uh, the lighting, plumbing fixtures, building envelope, et cetera. And there's two phases that were financed. Uh, the first one, uh, for about $4 million, and the second, 7.6, and very significant savings compared, again, to minimum code. So another example of how PACE can be used for new construction. This building in Houston, uh, sort of a conventional 80s uh, commercial office building, probably Class B. Uh, and there, the original mechanical systems were in place, uh, were a maintenance nightmare, uh, costing the owner a lot, plus a lower efficiency and higher utility bills. So they replaced all that. Uh, they uh, secured an incentive through the utility, uh, utility rebate for that. Assessment total of 1.3 million and significant utility savings compared to the old systems of 38%. And a couple more. Uh, this is an interesting application where uh, Simon Properties, which is a large mall operator uh, with different facilities, uh, different uh, malls uh, scattered across the state. They identified uh, a number of different malls, five different malls that needed uh, essentially the same things. Uh, HVAC upgrades, lighting upgrades, and water upgrades. So they did all of these at the same time under one financing arrangement. Uh, so if you are a property owner and you have properties in different areas of the state, then you could tie tie uh, improvements to all of those together under one PACE financing agreement. And finally, I believe uh, this, is, uh, this is a building that we like to feature. Uh, in fact, it's on the cover uh, of our program guide. Uh, this is a, a downtown Amarillo building, uh, the Barfield building, uh, been there for, you know, uh, 80, 90 years. It had fallen into disrepair. It was abandoned. There were plywood, there was plywood on the windows. Uh, there were birds uh, living in it, and the city was trying to raise money to have it torn down. And instead, a developer purchased it and had a vision and said, I think the bones of this property are good. The location is excellent. Uh, and it would be a great location for a boutique hotel, uh, which Amarillo did not have at the time. So they partnered with, with Marriott, uh, Bonvoy, which is their boutique uh, sub-brand, and created what's now called the Barfield Hotel. So it has super high efficiency, uh, ductless variable refrigerant flow, HVAC systems. Uh, this is a perfect solution for a retrofit because you don't have to run uh, forced air duct work uh, throughout a building uh, where you may have uh, lower ceilings or beams or things to deal with. Uh, they put in new LED lighting that's low voltage that actually allowed the uh, designers, lighting designers, to put in more lights uh, and for, for sort of aesthetics uh, than they originally had envisioned and still uh, have, have a much lower uh, electricity demand for the overall lighting. The building was not insulated. It now is. They furred out the walls, put in insulation, rebuilt every single window uh, with double pane, high efficiency windows. I have stayed in this building. I've stayed in this hotel since it was finished. It's one of the quietest hotels you've ever been in. You can't hear anything because of the enhanced insulation uh, that was put in there. So there, uh, because of the, the historic significance of the property, they're able to secure tax credit financing, as well as the PACE assessment to take care <clears throat> of those costs. So uh, very significant electric, water, and gas savings. So resources and, and where, to, where to turn next. Uh, as I mentioned, everything is on our website. Uh, that's here. Our technical guide and program uh, or technical standards and program guide are linked there. Uh, upcoming events and training, more case studies uh, beyond the ones I've shown you today are listed there too as well as our service provider directory. So if you are a contractor, engineer, uh, or other uh, potential stakeholder in PACE and would like to be listed there, uh, you can contact us uh, for service providers. Uh, we ask that you go through a training. I'll touch on that in a second. And then you can be listed as a, as a trained uh, PACE service provider. If you are a lender, uh, local lender, uh, and you'd like to be listed there as a lender, uh, we we have an application uh, where we will review and ensure that uh, all the lenders listed are registered to to do business in the state of Texas. That their balance sheet has wherewithal to support PACE projects, and and that they're a essentially a commercial lender. So we'll uh, so we, you can be listed there, uh, and, and there's a there's a process a pathway uh, for each of the service provider types uh, to be listed. 
on the training, uh, this is something that we introduced last year, uh, knowing that people these days uh, would prefer uh, not to have to travel to a location and spend time doing training. So uh, we have a self-paced, uh, deliberate play on words there, self-paced service provider training that is comprised of three different modules. These are recorded, uh, broken into PACE 101, technical standards and guidance, and then the project steps. There's a test at the end. And if you pass that test with a minimum score, then you can uh, be listed on the website as a service provider. And you'll also receive an e-badge from us saying that you were a trained uh, pay service provider. You can access that on our website here uh, under resources. And then the drop down is all the training courses. And uh, you, can, you can register there and take those classes. So with that, I will. Uh, uh, I'll stop talking and see if uh, that generated questions. And uh, you again, please use the Q and A at the bottom. Or if you if you entered something into the chat, you can. Uh, I'll take a look at that as well. And I'll leave this open for a minute. And I will also, just so you have it, uh, put my uh, put my contact information there as well. So dub, dub at texaspaceauthority.org is the way to get hold of me. Don't hesitate to email or ping me if you have questions or need other information. And with that, I'm not seeing questions come in, but please do uh, ask them offline if you, if you uh, need to or feel more comfortable. And again, if you have registered today, Look for an email from us uh, with a, a brief survey, uh, a copy of the slides uh, that I presented today, and a, uh, a link to the recording, uh, as well as if you would like uh, to request PDH credit, uh, you can, we'll send you a certificate saying that you have uh, trained for an hour, and you can use that if you're an engineer uh, or other professional that needs to, to document those hours, and that, that can be provided to you as well. So with that, we will end for today and look for future uh, T5 trainings like this and other training opportunities from Texas Pace Authority. Uh, have a great rest of your day, a good weekend, and we'll see you next time.